to Desert Island Comics, where great uh, comic practitioners get to choose their five favorite comics to take to a desert island, along with one luxury item uh, and their favorite flavor of crisps and a biscuit. Now, today, one of, if not the most celebrated artists ever to emerge from the UK, the winner of countless awards and the only Briton, I think I'm right in saying, to be inducted into the Harvey Awards Hall of Fame. He's worked with writers like Mark Miller, Stan Lee, Frank Miller, and of course, Alan Moore, with whom he created Watchmen, about which the poor guy has had to give interviews constantly for the last 34 years. But today, he gets to talk about something else. It is Dave Gibbons, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Dave. Thank you very much, Peter. Pleasure to be here and hopefully to talk about something other than Watchmen. Yes, well, we may touch on it briefly, but uh, what is the first comic that you're going to take with you to the Desert Island? Well, the first comic comes from my very early days of reading British comics, because we were quite lucky in my generation that we got British comics and American comics as well. Um, amongst them, uh, a series of, of books under the title War Picture Library. Now, these were digest size 64 page comic books only two pictures to a page that basically told tales of heroism and tales of shame and tales of redemption and tales of of, uh, of great emotional tone i think the best of them are characterized by really quite a powerful human story outside of the fact that the characters are blowing up tanks or shooting down stukas or doing something like that but it's interesting you should say that. Hang on a second, because uh, isn't the general perception of these war picture library stories that they tend to be just sort of Germans as baddies shouting, Gott in Himmel, die Englander, <laughs> uh, and, and the, the, the British going, take that, Jerry? Is, are you saying there's something yeah. deeper to them? The best of them were much more than that. They were, as I say, tales of redemption and tales with a really rich human, masculine human aspect to them. And the other thing worth, worth noting is that a lot of the writers had actually served in World War II and were ex-commandos or ex-sailors or ex-pilots. So there was a, a great feeling of authenticity to them. Uh, and as far as I can tell, all the weapons, all the machinery, everything you'd expect to be authentic is authentic. But really the attraction of them is the wonderful um, emotional tone. Now, there have been thousands of issues, but I've chosen one which is called Crash Call, which is about rescue ships, res rescue boats in the, um, in the North Sea, picking up um, pilots whose planes had crashed in the sea, people whose boats had been blown up under them. And so they would roam from the coast of Scotland up to the coast of Scandinavia, under fire from the from the Luftwaffe and from the German Navy, but they were there just to pick up survivors of battle. Um, and it's, it's drawn by the very best of the War Picture Library artists, in, in my view, an Italian called Gino D'Antonio, who had a, quite a wonderful way of drawing realistic machinery, but drawing very, very um, evocative characters. And in this particular issue, it's all set at sea, so it's endless vistas of waves and crashing rocks and uh, boats skimming across the water and aeroplanes attacking, um, all de delineated in the most wonderfully impressionistic way that actually brings the whole thing alive and makes it very much a, a felt experience. I would also say that not all the characters are heroes. They're all very fallible. They're, the stories are very compassionate. It's people who crumble under the pressures of the situation they find themselves in. People who let their comrades down and have to re re redeem themselves. So they're not just kind of hero comics. They're really quite deep and sometimes quite troubling kind of human stories. Okay, so you've got Crash Call and uh, bear in mind, you're going to have to read it over and over again for years to come, you know. Well, you know, I've been reading life. it over and over again for years past and I still get something from it. And I still marvel at the draftsmanship and the wonderful depiction of the stormy North Sea. It's quite incredible. OK, uh, choice number two. That would be Race for the Moon comics, issue three and Race for the Moon. Shall I Not tell you a little bit about the background? Go, you, you better tell us what this is, Race for the Moon. Well. Um, 
I think probably most of the people who are watching this have heard of an American artist called Jack Kirby, primarily known as a superhero artist. But in between the superhero boom of the 40s and the superhero boom of the 60s onwards, there was a really interesting period of American comics where comics were westerns, romance comics, crime comics, humour comics. And Kirby, being a very practised and very adaptable artist, also worked on a very, very few science fiction comics. But the particular title that I was interested in was called Race for the Moon. And these stories were all penciled by Jack Kirby, but were actually inked by some other quite illustrious artists, such as Al Williamson, who, who found great fame and fortune at EC Comics. And these people gave Kirby's very energetic, dynamic style a, a veneer, a wonderful texture, a wonderful richness that his work didn't always show when it was inked by somebody who was slightly uh, less concerned with the aesthetics of the job. Um, and there's one particular story in Race for the Moon, which the whole thing only ran for three issues, and it's called Space Garbage. And it opens with a very striking picture. My, mem my memory of this is very briefly of being at school and the art teacher said to us, you can draw anything you like. Oh, when, you, sorry, when you were at school, how, how old were you when you came across this? Well, I figured it out. I must have been about nine or ten. I thought I was younger, but I must have been about nine or ten years old. And I remember the teacher coming over to me and her saying, oh, what's this, David? This looks interesting. And I said, oh, please, miss, it's a, it's a man who's been manacled to an asteroid and left to die. She said, mm, oh, that, that's interesting. And what this was, was my swipe, my recreation of this wonderful splash page by Jack Kirby for a story called Space Garbage, which was indeed a man in a spacesuit manacled to an asteroid. Because these stories were unlike a lot of other science fiction stories that tended to have very clean cut heroes and very clean cut spaceships and adventures. These were really rough. They were about bank robbers and prospectors out on the wild frontier of space. And um, so I, I was so struck by this, this image. Fast forward a bit, or quite a lot actually, to about maybe, I don't know, seven or eight years ago when I was considerably older. And I found out that Titan Books were reprinting all this Jack Kirby science fiction stuff. So I asked their, their owner, Nick Lando, who I know very well, can I write the introduction to this, this collection? And he said, sure. And um, when they printed the book, the editor phoned me up and said, oh, Dave, you do know that now that we've scanned and printed this artwork, the original artwork is going to be put up on auction if you're interested in buying it. And I thought, I've got to have it. I've got to have that original piece of artwork. And mine was the successful bid. So I now have the original artwork as penciled by Jack Kirby and inked by Al Williamson hanging on the wall of my studio. You've got to so if you like, I will pick up this machinery and I will go over to that and you can have a look at it hanging on my wall. Uh, risk, we'll risk losing the connection for that. Okay, here we go. Hold tight, everybody. I hope this doesn't make you feel too nauseous. Hopefully you can see it. That's gorgeous. And I should also point out that I got the whole job, not just that splash page, but I've got the other four pages of the story as well. Mm -hmm. And I regularly get it out of the drawer and feast my eyes on it because it's exceptional. Can, I, I, can, you, can you give us an idea of how much she paid for it? As you could probably imagine, it was several thousand pounds. And I'm not a great collector of, of original art, but that particular piece is so pivotal and so, uh, it gives me such a personal feeling that I really, know, knowing it was for sale, I couldn't, couldn't resist it at all. Yeah. I'm just very interested in the fact that this image in particular of uh, the, sort of the, the, the astronaut manacled to, uh, to, to, to the asteroid um, was the image that attracted you. And you just said before that it was something about the realness of it, that it wasn't all like sort of smart, beautiful machines and things. Mm. Um, you've referred to this idea of authenticity, uh, mm. you know, in both of your choices so far. I just think it's... It's very interesting from the perspective of, you know, because there are, let's face it, there are artists and comic creators out there for whom authenticity is, is it couldn't be further away from what they're trying to achieve. No, but, but I mean, if I was to choose which direction I preferred, 
I actually don't like what you might call photorealistic artwork. I don't like artwork that's clearly being drawn from photographs quite clearly or artwork that's rendered so much that it actually just slows you down and you have to stop and look, look around. To me, some of the most effective comic book artists are the ones who can distill reality in a very telling and economical way. Like Kirby, for instance. I mean, Kirby had a long career. Towards the end of his career, things were stylized to the point that I think they might actually put some people off. But there was a sweet spot for Kirby, as there is for many artists, where his stylized version of re reality was actually more compelling than reality itself, you know? For me, the master of that style was actually um, the original Harvey. Kurtzman. Harvey Kurtzman. Um, yeah. When I look at his EC work, especially especially his his war pitch, his war stories, um, they stand apart from the art mm. of everybody else who was working at the time, um, because they managed to be somehow cartoony at the same mm. time as totally believable and, yeah. and driving you through the story. You know, he he he's quite happy to draw you know somebody's limbs in a way that limbs could never be, like completely sort of curved arms or something. Yes. In the interest of conveying an impression and telling a story. I was lucky enough to work with, with Harvey Kurtzman on one single job, and he was a really hard taskmaster. What was the, uh, the book? It's called Harvey Kurtzman's Strange Adventures, and it was essentially mad, mad comic. So I did a character called the Super Surfer, who was a very thinly disguised version of the Silver Surfer. Um, and it was such a joy to do because there was such energy in his in his layouts and in the way that he set, set everything up. But again, Kurtzman was one of those people that Alan Moore and I referenced a great deal when we were doing Watchmen because he, he had figured out so many of the basic grammatical points of comics and ways of expressing things. So he was a master, I think, of the true art of comics, which is the bit between the writing and, and the drawing. It's that, that no man's land that he excelled in. Fascinating. All right. Choice number three, please. Choice number three. Well, we've come a, a little bit nearer up to date. This is my favourite Batman comic, and this is Batman Year One, written by Frank Miller and drawn by David Masuchelli. Um, it was a mini series from DC. It came out shortly after Frank had had huge success with The Dark Knight Returns, which was his completely iconoclastic smashing of the Batman legend, where he focused on an older retired Batman in a much more harsh world and in a way Batman Year One sort of bookended with Dark Knight Returns. Dark Knight Returns was at the very end of Batman's career and Batman Year One was at the very beginning of Batman's career. Um, it was drawn as I say by David Mancinelli who added a wonderful again authenticity, naturalness to it. Although it was a superhero story or a costumed hero story. It didn't really feel like it. It felt more like a crime comic. And it was as much the story of Commissioner Gordon as it was the story of Bruce Wayne be becoming Batman. Um, Why have you chosen this in particular? Why is it so important to you? Well, again, because the storytelling is sublime. There's a couple of times in there. You know, what Frank is an expert at is turning the, the word track on or the picture track on and playing them against each other. So he, sh he shows what you don't have to have words for, and he tells what you have to have words for. There's one particular scene, and I, I, I would have to flip through the comic to get this precisely right, but it's Commissioner Gordon who's been assigned to Gotham City, and he's sat on the edge of the bed with his pregnant wife, so he's got all this family responsibility just to, about to come upon him. He realises what a cesspit Gotham City is, and he sat, sat on, the, on the edge of the bed with his head in his hands, and he says something about a city without hope. And the next picture is a small picture, a horizontal sliver, and it's the Gotham skyline with the tiny silhouette of someone in a bat costume. No words, nothing. And the fact that it's a small picture and not a splash picture, it just has a sublime effect. It has a, an effect that's hard to put into words, but it's an effect which you can only really do 
in comics because you can control the size of the image and the order of the images. It's the juxtaposition. And that is the art of comics. It's the juxtaposition between the words and the pictures that's so fascinating. Why did uh, Frank Miller, who's obviously a sort of a, you know, a, re a great artist of renown, why did he choose not to draw that particular comic himself? He had just been working with David Masicelli on Daredevil over at Marvel, where they had a very acclaimed run, where again, it was very much grounded in the reality of the real New York Hell's Kitchen with all the crime and all the griminess. So they, they had a feel for how each other could work. <clears throat> and, and again, as I say, Frank is a very, uh, a, a very perceptive writer and he would look at, I imagine, at what David had done and think he'd be the guy to do the Batman origin I've got, I've got in mind. And of course, it's also worth noting that <clears throat> that Batman Year One has now effectively become canon. It, it is what Christopher Nolan's Batman movies were. It's that same story. It's Bruce Wayne going from just a rich guy to becoming a creature of the night. And many of the same beats are hit in the movies as Frank and David hit in the comic. Which brings us to your fourth trip. <clears throat> My fourth choice, yes. Now I'm gonna attempt a French accent. It's called Ne Casse, which is Broken Nose by Charlier and Jean Giro. It's a Western, it's set in the 19th century. It's about, about a cavalry officer called Blueberry and his adventures across the Wild West of, of America. But it, I've particularly chosen this one because of Jean Giraud. Now Jean Giraud um, does these wonderfully convincing, again, authentic Western stories. But he has a, or he had um, an alter ego, a secret identity, which is Mobius. And Mobius, the Mobius side of Jean Giraud's personality, drew these wonderfully uh, imaginative, hallucinatory, dreamlike, um, larger than life, poetic stories of strange worlds, strange people, strange aesthetics. At the same time as he was doing the very realistic, very gritty blueberry stories. <clears throat> now, I couldn't really choose between those artists, and it is the same guy, so I've chosen Broken Nose because of all the books that he's done. It's the one that comes closest to integrating his Mobius personality with his Jean Giraud personality, in that it's got all the authenticity of the blueberry stories, and, and it's set in a very convincing Wild West, but it's drawn with the kind of linear style and the attention to detail and the, the hyper focus that his Mobius stuff has got. So by choosing that, I've got a really good cowboy story. I've got some absolutely wonderfully convincing Western work. And I've also got the wonderfully detailed visionary art of Mobius. Um, and did you, ever, did you ever meet the great man? You sound like you've met virtually everybody in comics. One particular evening I can recall was at a convention in London where Dark Horse Comics took a whole lot of us out to dinner. And I found myself sitting next to Jean Giro, and we were in one of these sort of rather uh, uh, kind of modern restaurants where you had a paper tablecloth and they had wax crayons in a, in a glass in the middle of it. I, I, I don't know whether there'd just been a kid's birthday party up there or something. Anyway, so Giro had his sketchbook with him, his little pocket sketchbook. And he said, oh, we should do something together. I said, that would be great. So I, I thought he was going to draw something for me to add to or to finish off. But what he did was he got one of these wax cranes and held it in the flame of the candle on the table and dribbled it onto a page in his notebook and then passed the notebook to me with a pen and said, finish it off. <laughs> so I added some little bits and rubbish to this to this gestural thing he'd done. And then it was my turn to get a wax crayon and do that. And of course he finished it off absolutely wonderfully. So it was great to spend some time with him and to do such an interesting artistic experiment. Something that seems to interest him time and again is the pursuit of being able to write a story without any preparation, be able to, to draw a story without any preparation of any kind and trusting yes. himself as an artist to just allow the story to go wherever it wants to go. Something I, I'm not aware of anybody else doing. No, it's, it's, it's almost like the, the, the words and the pictures truly do become one, that he's thinking and expressing himself simultaneously, not, 
writing a script and then drawing it or drawing something and then having to add, add words to it. Another heartening thing that actually that happened to me with John Giro was I remember going to the exhibition in Luca. They have a huge comics festival there. And he was a featured artist and they had a lot of his original artwork on view, kind of on glass top, glass top desks. So you could lean on it and look at the artwork very closely. And of course his work in print always looks immaculate. But one of these pages, he'd drawn this wonderful sort of castle and woods and characters flying through the air and everything. And it was all reflected in a lake, but he changed his mind. He'd drawn everything in reflection in the lake, but then he got some whiteout paint and painted over all those reflections. And it was still a lovely, lovely drawing, but I thought, yes, Mobius makes mistakes, which really, in my mind, elevated him even more that he, that he wasn't a god, that he could still take a wrong step and I'll just get rid of it and, and move on. So yeah, I mean, a tremendously inspirational character. And I think Mo Mobius is at that very top level of, of world-class comic artists. As indeed, may well be your final choice. My fifth book is The Ultimates, which was a Marvel comic series written by Mark Miller and drawn by Brian Hitch. Hitch's work is the first thing that strikes you because he's got this wonderfully sort of cinematic, widescreen, spectacular style. It's as if you're watching or you're looking at a drawn version of a Marvel movie, which is interesting because in fact that is so, but it's the other way around. It's the look of the Ultimates that the Marvel Universe movies have very much been built on. Stop me if I'm wrong, but um, th even the, the look of some of the characters that they kind of reinvented, like, for example, the appearance of Nick Fury, didn't they, for the Ultimates? Yes. And, and he actually looks almost exactly like Samuel L. Jackson, years well, before Samuel L. Jackson never took on the role. Well, of course, it is Samuel L. Jackson, because I, I think, and knowing them a little bit, I could almost say I know that Mark and Brian wanted to do something with the kind of traditional Nick Fury and thought, wouldn't it be great if he was a cool dude like Sam, Samuel L. Jackson? Mm -hmm. So Brian actually used reference, as I understand it, of Samuel L. Jackson as his model for, for Nick Fury. Oh, my God. And of course, and then it, it was so Samuel, Samuel L. Jackson. He actually became Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah. Samuel L. Jackson is a huge comic book fan. He's been in so many comic book and science fiction movies that he, of course, was just flattered r rather than offended that they used his, his likeness. Uh, thank you. But the, the whole way that they reimagined <clears throat> superheroes as kind of secret agents or scientifically gifted people, you know, meant that it became a much more believable universe than the traditional Marvel universe. And, you know, when you look at a, a Marvel movie, you're really looking at what Mark and Brian did with the Ultimates. Not, not only is the artwork spectacular, but Mark's stories are brilliant as well. They, they almost read like movies. Mark is the master of the moment, of the telling picture. You know, there's, 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 there's the one where this alien expects Captain America to surrender, and Captain America points at the A on his helmet and says, what do you think this stands for, France? which, you know, is, is a kind of slightly xenophobic thing to say, but it's the perfect Captain America thing to say. It's a perfect marriage of a wonderful image and a telling word balloon. So I, I just find it a wonderfully satisfying thing. And because it is about 1,500 pages, it's going to take me weeks to get through it. So it's a really good choice for the desert island. Um, by the way, it didn't escape my notice that once again, when you were talking about the Ultimates, you said that the thing that appealed to you about it was the fact that it had auth authenticity. Um, yes. So th this is <laughs> clearly a golden thread running through your your life and something that is of great interest and concern to you. Yes, and it's authentic. Yes, authenticity is important. And, and I've always found that same when I've drawn a script that somebody has written for me to draw. <clears throat> that there has to be something about it that makes me think that they've paid attention to the real world, mm. that they, they haven't just sloughed it off as, oh, it's a superhero comic or it's a science fiction thing. It's just, we'll just write the usual explosive garbage, you know. I, it, it always inspires me as an artist when I'm working with a writer who's clearly, you know, tried to make it believable and has tried to make the human emotions and actions authentic. 
Okay, and that now brings us uh, to, well, the, the final bits of business for your trip oh, to right. the island. You're entitled to take one luxury item. What is that going to be? Because hardly a day has gone by in my life when I haven't had a pen in my hands or haven't had a brush or a pencil or typed on a keyboard. And that's meant I've needed paper. So I think that really what I would take is a big stack of paper. It just has to be typing paper. It doesn't have to be, be anything fancy. And a stock of pencils or pens so that I can make marks on the paper so that I can write down my ideas. And I think that, you know, pencil and paper would give me the greatest satisfaction. And, and actually, going right back to the beginning again, the thing that I always loved about comics was it was a way of telling stories where all you needed was a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. And the only thing that stopped you from doing professional comics was your own talent, which you had the ability to work on. Whereas if you wanted to be a musician, you had to learn a musical instrument. If you wanted to be a filmmaker, you had to have cameras, actors, sets. So there was, it goes back really to the beginning of what attracted me to comics was that it was a very economical use of materials you could have a huge impact. Well, I, I'll tell you what then, as well as the pencil and paper, we will even throw in some sharpness. How's that? Well, that is above, above and beyond anything I, I, I could expect. Okay, sharpness, done. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, uh, now, and you do also get to take with you some food stuff. So we want to know what is your favourite flavour of crisps that you could take with you? Well, I'm very old school. I'm very old, first of all, and I'm very old school. And I know they brought in all these barbecue chicken and all these chilli and something. I, I can't be doing this. They're not a proper crisp to me. A proper crisp to me is ready salted. But the only concession I would make to modernity is crinkle cut. They're, they're, they're a nicer crunch. You get slightly more for your money. There's a bit more surface for the horrible oil and salt to cling to. Definitely um, masses of surface area there, yeah. Not particularly worried what mate they are, but crinkle cut, it has to be. Fair enough, crinkle cut it is. And you get to choose a type of biscuit to take with you on your yeah. old fashioned uh, sort of attitude <laughs> desert island. <laughs> well, I do love a biscuit. I, I have got a sweet tooth, but the ones that I always gravitate towards are the plain chocolate digestives. There's something about a plain chocolate digestive, a sort of classic restraint to it, where it's not trying to be one of the new kids, but it's the perfect blending of the, the crunchiness of the biscuit, the slight saltiness of the biscuit, the intensity of the dark chocolate, that to me it is a really, really satisfying biscuit. It's the ready salted crisp of the biscuit world. It is really, and yes, it's 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 classic. It's like me. It's it's classic. It stood the test of time, and it's who authentic. would like it? <laughs> and it's authentic, exactly. <laughs> it's not a Johnny Johnny come lately pretending to be a biscuit. It's a proper biscuit. Okay. Well, listen, Dave. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful you've been so open during this interview. In fact, you've been completely authentic. Thank um, you very much. Well, you thank know, you for the auth auth Thank you for the authentic questions, even if your backdrop certainly is not authentic. Don't tell them that. <laughs> Although they probably guess from the fact that my shoulder keeps disappearing anyway. We've had some technical issues with it, haven't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, uh, well, listen, that's all for now. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, if I could just turn to our virtual audience and say, could you please show your appreciation one more time for Mr. Dave Gibbons? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Peter. Thank you Cheers. and goodbye. Thank you.